Hello and welcome to KAUST Live. We're coming to you from the Winter Enrichment Program. You work at CERN, uh, or you, you do some of your work in collaboration with CERN. Talk about, uh, talk about the work that you're doing in a, in a big picture, and then we can sort of get into some of the, the areas. Yeah, so CERN is uh, probably the, the largest scientific laboratory uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's uh, several well, 13,000 scientists from around the world who uh, assemble at CERN to carry out experiments, uh, put forward theoretical ideas and so on. Mm. Uh, and, and I'm one of those. Uh, I used to be employed by CERN, but uh, now I work for King's College London. Right. So I share my time between uh, Geneva and London. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is basically we're trying to understand how the universe works. <laughs> and by doing that, we hope to answer what I would regard as humankind's universal, eternal questions. Yeah. You know, what are we? Where do we come from? And where are we going? Mm -hmm. uh, so what are we? That's what's the structure of matter. Mm -hmm. uh, where do we come from? You know, what happened early in the history of the universe? And uh, where are we going? That's the question. What's going to happen to the universe in the future? What, uh, what size team are we talking about here uh, when it comes to uh, your experiments are, are getting involved in some of these questions? So uh, I, I'm a theorist. I have a sort of small sideline in experiments, but right. uh, I'm uh, mainly a theorist. And uh, so typically, uh, you know, I work with uh, one or two students, one or two postdoctoral researchers, maybe mm -hmm. uh, another professor. So uh, a handful of people. Mm -hmm. uh, but experiments, those are... Uh, what we call an experiment, is actually a, a mammoth enterprise. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the big particle experiments at our uh, forefront accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, there might be uh, 3,000 scientists involved in that, wow. and a whole bunch of additional engineers and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason for that is because uh, in order to analyze the very rare phenomena that we're interested in, uh, we need very sophisticated detectors with many highly specialized components. Mm -hmm. And so each one of those has a team that uh, looks after it. A and then there's many different types of analysis that people are doing. Mm -hmm. And so there's many different teams pursuing, for example, different types of new particle. Right. So, so for instance, in, in previous talks that I've seen you give, you talk about things like the origin of, of, of mass and matter, the nature of dark matter. Um, what, what are give us a sense for a few of the experiments that, that are happening as a result of those inquiries that you're doing. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I think the biggest discovery so far with this forefront uh, collider, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, the foremost discovery has been a particle that we call the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is key to our understanding of how matter is made up because it explains where the masses of individual elementary particles come from. Uh, so this sounds like a very abstract question, but <clears throat> consider an atom. So an atom mm -hmm. has a nucleus sitting in the middle mm -hmm. and clouds of electrons going around. Mm -hmm. Now, if the electron didn't have a mass, it would fly away from the nucleus at the speed of light. No atoms, no molecules, no you, no me. Mm -hmm. So, it was very important if we want to understand how matter is made up to understand where particle masses come from, mm -hmm. and that's where the Higgs boson comes in. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that we have been doing. What we're doing now is, in addition to studying that particle in more detail to see yeah. whether we got the theory right and whether there's some discrepancy, uh, the big thing that we're trying to do is to understand dark matter. Right. So, the astronomers tell us that in addition to the visible stuff that you and I in this room are made of, uh, the universe is full of some obscure stuff that we can't see, mm -hmm. but it pulls the visible stuff around through its gravitational force. Right. And uh, that stuff may be particles, and those particles may be uh, possible to produce at the Large Hadron Collider. And so that's what the experiments are focusing on at the moment, and that's my main theoretical interest. Um, so in the LHC, you're actually causing the collisions of uh, uh, protons, is it? Uh, right. so, so, and then you watch the decay pattern of that. So, so talk about how that's helping prove the existence of or 
uh, talk about what that ends up uh, proving for you. Right. <clears throat> so uh, indeed, in the Large Hadron Collider, well, mm. first of all, it's large, 27 kilometers in circumference. Right. Uh, and hadron, that's our fancy jargon word for protons and related particles. Uh, so the collider makes uh, billions of collisions every second. And you know, perhaps one in a trillion collisions actually would be something interesting. Mm. So by something interesting, I mean where the energies of the colliding particles mm -hmm. are converted using Einstein's formula, E equals mc squared, into the mass m of some new heavy particle that we want to study. Mm. So uh, one example of that was how we collided protons to make the Higgs boson, which is a pretty heavy particle. Right. And uh, dark matter particles, they're, they're probably even heavier and so we need to make a lot more collisions, and that's what we're working on at the moment. So, so for, uh, from a, a layman's perspective, if it's even possible, like, w what do you I imagine these dark matter particles could or would be? And, and is, there a, is there a Higgs uh, who has postulated that they exist and they'll be eventually found? Uh, g give us a sense for that. <clears throat> so uh, these dark matter particles mm -hmm. uh, would have no electricity charge, because if they had electric charge, we could see we, we them. Could see them. They, right. They'd be visible, but they're dark. So no electric charge. Mm -hmm. uh, we think they only have very weak interactions, which makes them very difficult to detect. Oh. But what they do have is energy and momentum. So we look for events where there's a bunch of particles that come out that we can measure. Mm -hmm. But in addition, there's some energy and momentum that went AWOL. It's that, not conserved. Yeah, that went missing, exactly. Right. Interesting. But of course, yeah. we know that energy and momentum are conserved. Mm -hmm. So if we can't see it, maybe it was carried away by one of those dark matter particles. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it seems particularly difficult to study such ephemeral and mysterious parts of existence. I mean, was this the draw for you going into th this field of study? Well, what drew you um, to want to study such difficult to measure and see uh, things? Yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, for many of us, it's actually the, the difficulty mm. and the abstraction, which is in some sense you know, the most interesting and mm. attractive thing about it. Uh, you know, we know it's tough, and uh, we know that oft times you know, we don't succeed, but uh, we think it's worth trying because after all, we are trying to answer some of humankind's most, most basic questions. Yeah. So you've spent an amazing amount of time developing knowledge and things to, to study something that, uh, it, it seems like a gamble, I guess, from the outside at, at times. Uh, talk a little bit more about getting to the place where you're studying such theoretical, such ephemeral things uh, in, in your work. So. It's true that what we study is ephemeral, yeah. but uh, in some sense what we're doing is we're recreating the conditions that occurred very, very early in the history of the universe, mm. uh, very early in the history of the Big Bang, mm. uh, something like a, a tenth of, of a billionth of a second old, and, and even when the universe was younger than that. Right. So, uh, so, of course, to study that uh, requires a, a fair amount of abstraction yeah. requires a fair amount of, of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so personally, I you know, spent a lot of time studying mathematics uh, when I was a high school student mm -hmm. and when I was a university student mm -hmm. before really getting embarked on this uh, research in theoretical physics that I do now. Right. Um, I believe in 2012 is when you uh, sort of verified that the Higgs boson, right, you, you, you proved that, that it, it did exist. So talk about the Higgs steria uh, that <laughs> happened around that in, in, your, in your words. Um, and what is it like to be part of such a seminal moment uh, in science? Yeah, well, the story really started back in uh, 1964 mm -hmm. when uh, Peter Higgs and some other colleagues uh, came up with this idea for where the masses of particles like the electron might come from. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for 48 years, it was like the quest for the Holy Grail, uh, <laughs> where physicists were thinking where the Higgs boson might be, what mm -hmm. it might look like, how you might be able to make it, what it would look like when you had made it. And uh, well, that was something that uh, I got interested in 
uh, I guess the first time was in 1975, but, uh, a long time ago. Anyway, eventually uh, in the 2000s, uh, CERN built the Large Hadron Collider, and for the first time we had an accelerator which you know, was pretty much guaranteed to find the Higgs boson if it exists. But at that time we couldn't be sure. Right. And uh, you know, some of my colleagues were saying, ah, it's all bullshit, it doesn't exist. <laughs> So uh, it was pretty exciting when they switched the machine on and mm -hmm. they started getting some hints of something that might be the Higgs boson. And uh, then finally, a special seminar was announced. Uh, so we knew that you know, this was the crunch time. Mm -hmm. Was it going to be announced or was it going to be disannounced, if you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we got Peter Higgs to, to come to CERN to, to visit. <coughs> And uh, my wife and I had the pleasure of uh, hosting uh, Peter Higgs for dinner in our house the night before. Right. And uh, then we went to the seminar and yes, there it is. Well, I, actually I should be a little bit more careful. Uh, what was announced at that time yeah. was the discovery of a new particle which looked like the Higgs boson. But we couldn't be absolutely sure. There are a number of checks that needed to be run, mm -hmm. more data and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was probably only really in 2013 that we could say with any confidence that this new particle that's been discovered really, really, really is a Higgs boson. How do you know that it is the Higgs boson as opposed to one of the number of other uh, things that make up uh, the electrons? Yeah, so, so the Higgs boson has certain uh, unique properties. Uh, so for example, uh, because the Higgs boson gives masses to other particles, its, it's couplings to other particles, its affinities for other particles depend on their mass. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know of other particles which couple, for example, in the same way to an electron and a muon, a different type of particle that's heavier. Mm -hmm. So other particles behave in the same way, but the prediction was that the Higgs boson would behave differently for different types of particle. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to check that to some extent, not completely, but everything is so far consistent with the idea that this particle really is connected with other particles' masses. Then there's another uh, property of particles, which is they're all a little bit like ballerinas. They all spin around, some of them faster, some of them slower, but they all spin, except for the Higgs boson. It was a prediction that the Higgs boson would not spin. And uh, so it was important to try to check that. And uh, the checks came in that there was no evidence that this particle was spinning. And so consistent again with the idea that it's the Higgs boson. Fascinating. Um, what, what implications does that have that it doesn't spin? Do you think? So, that means that it could be you know, sitting in the universe today. Uh -huh. In fact, we believe it is, and that's why particles have masses, because they go through this sort of uh, swamp of, of Higgs, if you like, that exists throughout the universe, mm. and that's where the mass comes from, because they're you know, trying to get through this Higgs swamp. Uh, but then the question arises, well, what happened early in the universe? Uh, was the Higgs field around then? Right. Or you know, was something different happening? And uh, that's, again, a very active area of research. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes me that uh, you know, every time you read deeper into physics, you seem to get to a, a, a lower or more fundamental level of particles. Uh, is there a, another level behind w what we know at, at this current time? Do you think that we've sort of found the ground floor of uh, the number of particles and things? Give, give a sense for that. So most of us think that there are a whole bunch of other particles out there waiting to be discovered. Wow. Okay. And so then the, for me, the, the big question is whether they're all particles which are as fundamental, as important as the Higgs boson or the electron, or are there other particles which are even more fundamental? Mm. And that's an open question. So many of my colleagues, for example, have suggested that the Higgs boson is not 
an elementary fundamental particle that's actually made up out of you know, little bits inside. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're trying to do with our experiments now is to try to see inside the Higgs boson to see whether it's made up out of something else. Right. Uh, maybe there's a whole bunch of other related particles that we can discover. The universe is about 13.7 billion years old. How do we know that? So we can measure the rate at which the universe is expanding today uh, by uh, observing uh, distant galaxies. Mm -hmm. uh, we can tell that the uh, light in those different galaxies gets redder and redder the further away they are. And uh, that, if you measure that very accurately, that gives you a measure of how rapidly the universe is expanding. So we have to do some sort of extrapolation because we can't see stars all the way back to the beginning of the universe. Right. But uh, the theoretical calculation is that, uh, as you say, the universe is 13.7 billion years. Does it ever seem like you have the most audacious job description ever? Uh, someone <laughs> trying to get to the, the nature of reality? Uh... Well, uh, <laughs> The nature of reality. Now, reality is a very uh, you know, loose philosophical. The nature of nature, maybe. Right, right. right. So, yeah, we're just trying to uh, read nature's instruction book. So, uh, nature has been kind enough to give us lots of cute clues. Mm -hmm. you now, all these galaxies, all these stars, all these phenomena in the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're lucky that we are able to do these experiments uh, to, in some sense, recreate what happened in the early stages of the Big Bang mm -hmm. in the laboratory. Yes. And uh, so we're just trying to read the instruction book. Right. Um, in terms of the work that's going on at CERN now, um, what, what things into the future uh, do you see happening? Uh, again, now that uh, the, the Higgs sensation, the Higgs stereo is sort of calmed down a bit, uh, what new things uh, are scientists looking to, to prove or understand uh, with the LHC or even other uh, you know, facilities here? Right, so uh, we're continuing to study the Higgs boson to see whether there's any deviation from theory. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking for dark matter particles, as I described. Yeah. And we're trying to understand not just where the masses come from that we think we understand, mm -hmm. but why the masses have the sizes that they do. Mm. So uh, if I express everything in units of the mass of the proton, which uh, is the same thing as uh, the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, mm. I call that one, okay? Mm -hmm. So an electron comes in at one two thousandth. Uh, the Higgs boson comes in at about 130. And then there are other particles that are strung out with different masses. Mm. We don't understand the pattern of those masses, why some are heavier, why some are lighter, and we don't understand the, the overall size. Mm. You know, why one rather than a thousand or a hundred million? And uh, so there are all sorts of theories that, that try to understand why the particle masses have the values that they do, right. uh, but Experimentally, they're very elusive. I see. What, what do you, what's your pet theory on uh, what, what the explanation for that is? Is it that we have a too small a sample size, particularly for the Higgs boson? Um, or is it that uh, there's some other structure at play that we don't understand? Well, it, probably it's just that uh, if, if there is new physics out there which, which does this job of fixing the scales of particle masses, mm. that it's new physics with some mass, with some energy, which is beyond the range of our current accelerators. Ah, okay. So, uh, for example, I'm a big fan of a, call, of a theory called supersymmetry, mm. which predicts that there should be a whole bunch of new particles which might weigh, let's say, 10 or perhaps 100 times mm. as much as a Higgs boson. So I would love to continue the search for such particles, mm. Uh, presumably by making a higher energy collider, we should be capable of producing them. Is, there, is, is that even possible on Earth? I, I know that some of the conditions uh, that you even have to create are some of the coldest in the universe and 
some of the hottest in the universe, it, it, it seems quite improbable. Do we have to go off of Earth to, to conduct some of these bigger experiments, do you think? Or? No, we could uh, build a, a larger, more powerful uh, collider here on Earth. And uh, there's uh, projects being developed uh, both at CERN and also in China, mm. uh, designs for such an accelerator. I think technologically it's certainly feasible. Uh, it would cost a bit, okay, <laughs> uh, but it's certainly technically feasible. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you're, you're speaking tonight, you have, a, you have a keynote, and I don't want to give too much away, but I'd, I'd love for you to explain uh, your, your T-shirt, uh, if, if, you, if you would humor me. Uh, what, is, what is your, your T-shirt? Uh... Okay, well, th this is uh, the basic uh, formula uh -huh. which uh, underlies uh, our theory of the visible matter in the universe. Wow. And uh, so the, the top line here, uh, this is our shorthand for describing the fundamental interactions. So electricity, magnetism, and so on. And then the second line, uh, that's how those different fundamental forces act on particles of matter. So this psi here, that's, that's a, a representative for a particle of matter. Mm -hmm. So the third line, so we now got another symbol coming in, phi, uh, and that's how we represent the Higgs boson that I was talking about earlier on. And that's how we think the Higgs boson gives masses to the particles of matter like the electron. Mm -hmm. And then uh, right at the bottom, we've got, well, perhaps it's in the right place, what I might describe as the guts of the Higgs mechanism, <laughs> sort of the engine room which makes the whole thing work. Well, best of luck in your keynote, and, and thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, join us tonight at 5.30 p.m. for Dr. Ellis's keynote, as well as tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. as we speak with Zhao Pekenau of CERN. Um, you know, he, he runs the scientific exhibits he and his team share with the world. Now, both of those sessions will be streamed live on the KAUST Facebook page. Uh, as always, remember to comment, like, and share using the hashtag WEP2019 on all the KAUST social channels and from everyone here at KAUST. Thank you for joining us.